and welcome to Demystifying Succession Planning, part of the SIOP Practitioner Webinar Series. I am Marnie Falcone, and I'm a consultant at FMP Consulting in Alexandria, Virginia. I have my master's in I.O. from George Mason University, and I've been consulting in human capital for the past nine years. Hi, my name is Mike Hamburn. Uh, similar to Marnie, I have a master's degree in I.O. psychology from George Mason University. Uh, I've been working with FMP Consulting for 11 years. Um, and early in my career, I gravitated more towards projects that I thought I was adequately prepared for. Um, so as an I.O. psychologist, I worked on a lot of projects that involved uh, job analysis, uh, designing selection programs, uh, individual development plans, uh, competency modeling, some workforce data analysis. Uh, but I never really jumped into a succession planning project. I actually kind of avoided it. I, uh, I, I figured that succession planning was a specialized field that required uh, real senior level uh, technical expertise that, uh, that I was not prepared for. Um, and I, I think a lot of IO psychologists feel that way, especially those who are uh, relatively new out of school. And that's really the, the purpose of this webcast today. Um, is, uh, is, is to show that as IO psychologists, we are very well prepared for succession planning. We just don't use the term succession planning very frequently. It's not very prevalent in uh, either IO research or coursework. Um, at the recent IO, uh, at the recent SIOP conference, uh, there weren't really any presentations or panel discussions with the title, um, with succession planning in the title. Now, there were many presentations and, and panel discussions that involved concepts related to succession planning, but we don't really use the term succession planning very frequently. It's much more of a practitioner term. Um, and, uh, and so as a result, IO psychologists uh, don't really uh, gravitate as much towards, towards succession planning, at least those who are relatively new, um, relatively new practitioners. Um, okay, so throughout the, uh, the webcast, we'll be demonstrating um, that uh, the different components, how the different components of succession planning are based in IO psychology. Yeah, and our goal today is to really uh, talk about how IO concepts create the foundation for successful succession planning. And we'll also provide some tips for how you can apply your IO knowledge and your IO background to establish technically sound succession planning programs. Okay, so we're going to start with a basic definition. What is succession planning? Um, before we jump in, it's uh, important to know that succession planning is a strategy that is based in the understanding that at some point, whether planned or unplanned, everyone will leave their position, everyone will leave the organization, and we need to be prepared for that transition when it happens. So a basic definition, it's the preparation of current employees for advancement into key positions. Now there are more broad definite, there are more detailed definitions, but I, I think this is a, a good basic definition uh, as an introduction into succession planning. Um, and the result of a succession planning program is not a standalone plan for the organization. It's also not a standalone plan for one individual position. It's really the systematic integration of a variety of business management, IO psychology, employee development, and HR programs that all have to work together to ensure that the future success of the organization uh, through employee development. Um, and uh, if you look at the common components of succession planning, which we've compiled into uh, the pyramid here, uh, you'll see that many of these concepts are IO concepts. Uh, we conduct ex extensive research in these areas of job analysis, employee assessment, leadership, groups and teams, training and development, mentoring, um, recruitment, organizational culture and change, selection, program evaluation, motivation and engagement. These are all areas that we know very well. We've studied extensively. Um, but I think the reason that succession planning doesn't get into research or the literature is that it's, it's the combination of all of these components. So researchers tend to focus in their specialty area. IO psychologists, researchers have a, a, a strong working knowledge. I think of 
all areas of IO psychology. But we tend to focus our research in one specific area. Uh, succession planning is the combination of a variety of areas, and, and it is difficult to isolate one particular component. And so it's, it's difficult to research, um, to create it as an area of research. And so that's really why it stayed more of a, of a practitioner concept than an academic concept. Uh, but there really is no academic field that could better prepare you for succession planning than IO psychology. So the workforce is changing, and it's changing quickly. Baby boomers are retiring at a rapid rate every day, and the next generation, Generation X, is going to be taking over those key leadership positions. But there aren't enough employees in Generation X to backfill those baby boomers at the rate that they're leaving the workforce. And so we need to look towards the younger generation, the millennials, to start filling those key positions as well. Uh, one of the great characteristics of those generations is that they're engaged, they're motivated, they want to advance quickly, and they want to find those opportunities in organizations. Uh, you might have noticed that uh, the trend now is that employees are switching jobs much more fre frequently than they used to. In fact, the average is about every four to five years employees are switching jobs. And most of the, the reasoning behind that is because of a perceived lack of advancement opportunities or career pathing options. The, these employees are not seeing themselves uh, in leadership positions in the long term at organizations, and therefore they leave. Um, on the other hand, uh, organizations feel that there isn't enough talent, enough of a qualified talent pool to fill their key leadership positions should they leave. And then what's more is that they're not actually prepared uh, and don't have the structure in place to have those in individuals fill those positions when those key leaders do leave. So you have uh, organizations feeling like they don't have a talent pool to select leaders from or develop leaders from, and then you have employees feeling like there's no clear advancement opportunity for them to move up in the organization um, or stay with the organization in, in the future. Um, and so this is really where succession planning comes in because Succession planning gives organizations the stability and the structure that they need when key leaders leave. And then it also gives employees the opportunity for advancement. It helps them visualize their role in the organization and their future in the organization, um, thus imp impacting their retention. And so it's really a win-win uh, for both the organization and the employees. All right, now through the remainder of the presentation, we are going to focus on the basic succession planning process. Um, now, any program you put together may have uh, more or fewer steps than this, but what we've outlined is six basic steps that are common in, in almost all successful succession planning. Uh, step number one is to identify key positions requiring succession planning. And we've defined key positions as positions directly critical to the accomplishment of the organization's mission. Um, and we've listed a few examples here uh, that are most commonly used in succession planning. I, I think the most common is the one in the middle, key leadership positions. Uh, these are pretty easy to define. You basically look at your org chart, uh, see which positions have the, the most uh, the authority over the, the mission, those that manage the greatest number of people, and those are positions that you need filled, you need filled by uh, highly talented people, and if you were to lose someone in that position, uh, you would need to replace those that skill set, and you would need to fill those roles and responsibilities quickly. Um, and so uh, since key leadership positions are common across all succession planning, we're going to focus on leadership positions through the remainder of the webcast. But we did want to point out a couple of other examples of key positions that you also might want to focus on. Uh, one is specialized skill positions. These are positions um, that, that, are, that have skill sets, uh, require skill sets that are in high demand. Uh, they may be difficult to fill quickly if you were to lose someone. Um, and these are really those positions that are, are really tied to your mission, the ones that, uh, that you really can't complete your, your organizational goals without. 
uh, another type of position is a standalone position. Now, this may not necessarily be directly tied to the mission, but these are positions where you may only have one or two people in this type of position. You may only have one or two people in the entire organization with this skill set. Uh, and if you were to lose them, you don't have the bench strength to backfill that position. Um, so it's important that, that you identify ways uh, to cover those roles if you were to lose someone unexpectedly. So the goal when it comes to identifying key positions is really, again, as Mike mentioned, to identify those that are critical to the mission that if left vacant, uh, the organization would no longer be able to fulfill its mission or continue to serve its customers. And uh, many of uh, these Many of these positions can be identified from things that are already developed in the organization. So any kind of organizational or workforce assessment, um, any kind of workforce planning processes, uh, strategic planning documents, um, anything that really helps outline the organization and how it's structured will be really helpful in identifying those key positions. Um, additionally, organizational charts, hiring data, or HR data are all great ways or places to look to try and identify those key positions. And in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide, you'll see a blue box that has, that's labeled IO Connection. And here is where we'll tie back uh, each of these steps or the concepts to complete each of these steps back to key concepts in IO. And so when it comes to identifying key positions, of course, organizational development is the first thing that comes to mind when it comes to being able to, to, to pinpoint those pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's, that's critical. And I think the, a term that you used is, is integrate, and that's a term we're going to be saying throughout the webcast. Um, the, the step of identifying key positions and many of the steps involved in succession planning should not be new to your organization. You shouldn't have to introduce, introduce many new uh, groups or, or initiatives. There is already information and data out there available. It's just a matter of, of systematically integrating what your organization already does to, to, help, uh, to help engage and develop the next generation of leaders. All right, so after step one, we move to step two. So we've identified the key positions that require succession planning. Uh, and the next step is to define the position requirements of those positions. Um, and since we are focusing on key leadership positions, we just have a, a, a sample leadership competency model here. We've, uh, we've pulled these competencies from the yeah, Office of Personnel Management's Executive Core Qualifications, um, but you would see very similar competencies really in any type of leadership competency model uh, that you look at, which uh, Marnie will be talking about next. Yes, yeah, so the goal here outside of defining position requirements is to really understand and break down the, the requirements of those key positions. And, and any I.O. project that, that you come across will really kind of have those foundational components of job analysis and leadership and understanding what makes up that particular job. Um, one thing that is a little bit different than, than maybe your traditional job analysis is you're not only looking at what the, the position looks like now, but you're also looking at what it will look like in the future. And so whether an individual leaves the organization, that key position becomes vacant now, or in five years from now or ten years from now, we still want to have an understanding of what those positions look like so that we can appropriately plan and appropriately develop employees to fill those positions. Um, and again, uh, you'll hear this throughout the presentation, uh, don't start from scratch. Use existing information that you already have, um, existing job analyses or position descriptions or vacancy announcements, anything that's available that helps break down the components of those jobs. Um, benchmark competency models that might be, be developed for similar positions or uh, similar positions within the organization or even similar positions outside of the organization. And again, focusing on the future, while it's important to understand the current state now, it's even more important to, to understand what those positions look like in the future so that you can appropriately plan and design your program around that rather than around what is currently required. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think over the last decade plus as a human capital consultant, I've seen many leadership competency models, and they all are based on the same 
basic concepts. And so the, the point of don't start from scratch, I mean, do some research and identify what competencies are common across all leadership or most leadership competency models. We uh, showed some samples on the slide before. Uh, then you want to tailor it to your organization. And I'm not saying find a, another model and apply it to your organization, but find what the common concepts are, find one that, that feels right for your organization, and then work with the leaders in your organization to, uh, to refine it um, in a way that will really make sense to develop uh, the next generation of leaders. That gets to the next point, is that when defining leadership competencies, keep the requirements general enough to apply across the organization. You don't want to develop a model that's so specialized that it's only that it's only fit for one position or a small group of positions. Um, and the reason for that is uh, when you develop your leadership development program, which we'll talk about in the next step, you want that to be developing leaders that could fill a variety of potential positions in the future. Now, you may not even know right now what your future leadership positions will be, but if you keep your, your leadership competency model broad enough in a way that uh, no matter how you develop those future leaders, they could be they could be able to fill a number of roles, and that, that's where, um, where you'll really, you really have some success with your, your leadership development program. Okay, and uh, again, in, in the lower right corner, you know these concepts. It's job analysis and leadership. And if you, you combine those two, you're essentially defining the requirements of your leadership position. Which brings us to our next step. We've identified key positions. We've defined the position requirements. And now it's time to design the development program that will prepare the next generation to fill those positions. Great. So the goal here, of course, is to create a program that is structured, it's well-defined, it's based in the competencies and the requirements of the key positions. Um, and of course, that will further support the growth, retention, and engagement of the employees, as I mentioned before, showing them that uh, they're valued, that you're investing um, in them and their future. And so uh, some things to consider about this, of course, a blended approach to learning is always a best practice. Uh, we have up here the 70-20-10 rule of leadership development, where 70% is uh, from on-the-job experience, 20% is learning from others, such as a coach or mentor, um, and then 10% is actually formalized uh, training. And uh, there are many different approaches to leadership development, many different programs, types of blended learning approaches, but uh, some best practices, really all of leadership development programs or successful leadership development programs have some type of assigned mentor or coach. Uh, to the employees, they have rotations and stretch assignments, and they also have cohort projects that allow the employees to kind of hone their interpersonal and collaboration skills. Yeah, and thinking about what you said earlier about millennials really looking for those career advancement opportunities, um, the, the, the personal component, the relationship component of leadership development is critical there. Having a mentor or a coach who has who is experienced, who's been in the organization for a long time, who can impart that institutional knowledge, can really close that age gap. And age shouldn't be a, a barrier to the leadership uh, position, but more of that experience and that institutional knowledge. So um, what we, we see here is really not so much a focus on, on training, but rather through experience, through on-the-job experience and those relationships. Um, and then getting to work with others, those cohort projects, really any of these best practices, we could spend an entire webcast or series of webcasts pointing out best practices on how to best design your leadership development program. Uh, this is meant to be more of an introduction to succession planning, but these are all areas where, where there's a lot of information for you to help, uh, to help you design your program. Uh, but the important thing is to really make the development applied on the job work uh, where you're, you're getting to interact with others. Also because leadership competencies tend to be more of the soft skills. And so it's not so much technical skill training, but rather a cohort project where you get to develop your soft skills. Um, that's, that's really critical. Um, and uh, again, um, you've got don't start from scratch. Uh, we mentioned that earlier. Um, and then the point before that is cultivate a learning environment. So uh, a learning culture, a learning organization, a learning environment 
um, the, the focus there is that typically with succession planning, I, I think sometimes we default to identifying high potential employees. And we'll be talking about that in a minute. That is, that is critical to identify your pipeline of future leadership. Um, but uh, oftentimes we focus all of our energy and resources and training and development on those high potential employees. Uh, but in reality, in order for an organization to grow and to evolve, uh, you really need all levels of employees, all types of employees, to be constantly developing and learning. You want everyone in the organization to feel as though they have some development opportunity and that, and that they're constantly growing uh, to keep them engaged and also to advance your organization. Um, so while we focus some of the leadership development on those high potentials, uh, the, the, the knowledge management and the, uh, the uh, the institutional knowledge, um, we, really, we really want to cultivate an environment where everyone feels as though they should be continually developing in their role. And uh, in the, the lower right corner, you've got the IO connection. Again, you know these areas, uh, leadership, training, and development. Uh, and that brings us to our fourth step. So we have defined the position requirements, designed a leadership development program to develop those leadership skills and competencies, and the next step is to identify high potential employees to develop into those leadership roles. Um, identifying uh, the, the cohort of uh, the next generation of leaders. And so the goal here is to really make sure that we're accurately identifying those individuals, those high potentials, um, who the organization is willing to invest um, in to serve as the next generation and, and lead the organization in the future. Um, this, of course, uh, with a big focus on uh, performance management, employee assessment, motivation, uh, a high potential employee is, is one that's not only a high performer, but it also has that component of motivation and engagement um, and uh, that willingness to kind of go the extra mile, uh, which is very difficult to measure, which we'll, we'll talk about um, in, in a few slides. And uh, many people use high potential and high, per high performer interchangeably, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, while uh, all high potentials are definitely high performers, not all high performers are high potentials. And um, it's really important to kind of note that difference. Um, when identifying a high potential, you want to kind of think about a few different things. You want to think about whether or not that individual is capable of, of filling that, that leadership position, um, whether that's now or after, you know, going through uh, the employee development whether or not that individual uh, will likely even get to that level, and then whether or not that employee is actually going to stay with the organization for, uh, for the long run. Uh, you don't want to invest in somebody that you anticipate will leave to a competitor or another organization in the next few years. Um, so those are three different things that you should be thinking about when, when identifying high, high potentials. Um, and of course, when, when identifying those outside of our, our regular performance management and you know, employee assessment procedures that we might have in place, there's a really great tool out there called the Nine Box Grid uh, that is a really good way of helping organizations identify those high potentials and kind of assess the talent pool as a whole and kind of rank order or identify individuals who might want to go through, who you might want to send through that leadership development program and prime for those, those key positions. Um, and here is uh, an example uh, of a nine box uh, tool. And as you can see along the X axis, you have performance and then along the Y axis, you have potential. And so the key here is really to assess employees and kind of pit their performance against their potential. And so, of course, employees that are high performers and high potentials are going to be the ones that are most primed to take over those key leadership positions, but those really aren't the only ones. Um, individuals that might be, uh, you know, still effective in performance but have high potential might need a little bit more development time but still can get there. Um, so th those employees might not be able to fill your short-term needs or your more immediate needs, but they might be uh, 
great for a long-term plan once they have the time for that development. Yeah, I think this is an area where IO psychologists can really improve what is happening out uh, within organizations and succession planning. Now, I think too often we see when organizations don't have a succession planning program in place, they, they promote their high performers. And if they have been in a technical track their entire career, they've developed their technical skills, well, that's not necessarily an indication that they have those soft skills, those interpersonal skills, to be successful as a leader. And so by promoting someone who has been a great technical performer, well, you've now removed one of your high performing technical performers from the role that they were in. You've got to fill that position, and now they're also in a position that they may not be ready for. And so you really hurt two positions by making a promotion that, that did not consider potential. Um, now, when it comes to assessing potential, I, I think this is an area where IO psychologists can really uh, ad advance the identification of high potential employees. And there is research out there related to identifying high performers. Um, and and the, the reason I, I think IO psychologists can really help this, uh, this area is that performance management is an area that we have researched and we have we've designed programs for uh, for decades um, the assessment of potential right now is really still more in the hands of practitioners and in the hands of managers without a lot of I, I think great um, great objective tools and it, it's it's still very subjective, trying to figure out whether this person has the right level of motivation and soft skills. So how can, uh, and, and this is a challenge I'll, I'll pose to, um, to, to IO psychologists getting into succession planning, is put your, uh, your, your assessment rigor to work when it comes to identifying potential. Make sure the tools that are being used in assessing potential um, are, are defensible, are based on objective measures, and not just uh, who, who the manager has the greatest amount of exposure to or, or who is most like the manager. I, I think a lot of times we fall into a lot of those errors that we've, we've learned about in school when it comes to assessing potential because uh, we just don't have the, the types of tools we do for assessing performance. All right, so back to uh, the basic process. Um, we've identified key position, we've defined the requirements for the position, we've designed the development program uh, to develop current employees to fill that position, and we've identified high potential employees who we want to invest in to develop as the next generation of leaders. This next step is to prepare for planned and unplanned transitions. Now, this step is not as tied to IO concepts. It is really more of a, of a practitioner-driven practice. Um, I, I like to think of this as, as our insurance policy. Uh, it is documenting, um, documenting the, uh, the key roles and responsibilities, the duties, um, the professional network of each of your key position incumbents. Um, and so what that will do is it will ensure continuity of operations during a planned or unplanned transition. It's basically developing a roadmap for, the, uh, for that position's backup or eventual successor to be able to step in as their instruction manual to be able to perform the roles and responsibilities of that position in case we lose the incumbent. Um, and uh, one one tip, uh, there are a couple tips here, but, but one is to designate a backup for all key positions. And that way you've got your transition plan in place, you've got documented what needs to get done uh, in case we lose the incumbent, and you've got your designated backup who is aware of that transition plan. And uh, now this does not give that person a preferential treatment in terms of getting that position long term, but as a safety net or an insurance policy, it will it will enable operations to continue uh, without that, that leader in place. Um, and then the second tip is uh, to require all key position incumbents to establish a transition plan. Um, that will ensure that you are covered across all of your key positions uh, in case of a, an unexpected loss, that you will be able to continue your operations, continue to meet your mission uh, if you were to lose someone. All right. so. 
after we've put that in place, uh, it, it doesn't really fall into the same cycle as developing the next generation of leaders, but it is an important step in t uh, to, to ensure continuity of operations. Uh, the final step here is to select an internal or external candidate to fill the position that needs to be filled. Um, now, so far through the webcast, we've talked about developing internal candidates, uh, but we don't want to uh, only limit our search to internal candidates. We definitely want to show that there are career paths within the organization uh, and that there are opportunities for current employees to advance into leadership positions. Um, but depending on your culture and depending on the needs of the position, uh, it may be more appropriate to select internally versus externally. Um, and so you want to cast as wide a net as possible when selecting for your key positions. And so uh, making sure you've got a, a um, strong understanding of those external pools of talent that could also fill your key position uh, it is important in addition to knowing what your current bench strength is for those leadership positions. And so this is really kind of the bread and butter of I.O. selection and assessment. And, um, you know, this is almost the capstone of the, success, the succession planning process. And, and uh, it really uh, depends on how well you did the previous steps because if you didn't identify the key positions properly or the key components, you're not going to be able to develop a selection instrument or a process that best and most accurately identifies those individuals. Um, and of course, uh, developing a process that is uh, valid and legally defensible and all of those great things that we talk about when we talk about selection is of course important. Um, but this is, is the most important step because the impact is so big if you make a wrong decision or you make a wrong selection because these we've already established that these positions are key to an organization's uh, success, they're key to uh, you know an organization continu continuing its mission, and so the wrong person in that position uh, is impactful. And, and so we want to make sure that, that we're doing the selection process uh, properly. Um, in addition to that, uh, upon selection, we, we often talk about the individuals that are actually going to be selected or fulfilling these key positions. But it's also important to, to think about the organizational impact as a whole and how the selection of these individuals impact the organization. And so we also want to be thinking about the organizational uh, culture and change that will happen upon that individual being uh, selected into that position. And so uh, the goal of succession planning is, is continuity of operations, right? And so we want to make sure that not only are the we establishing continuity for those key positions, but also for the rest of the organization and the, mm -hmm. the the remainder of employees in the organization. And so making sure that not only that individual is prepared, but all employees are prepared for that change in leadership or that change in a key position because many times these employees are reporting to that person or uh, or uh, they, they are working with that person on a daily basis. And so we want to make sure that they know what's going on, they're prepared for that change when it happens, and that they're also kind of bought in and on board uh, with the process as well. Okay, so that completes the basic succession planning process. It, we were able to demonstrate uh, how the, the key components of succession planning are based in IO psychology, and that we as IO psychologists really have the the training and expertise to be able to, to help advance the practice of succession planning. And that brings us to our first recommendation, which is volu volunteer your I.O. expertise to support the development or implementation of a succession planning program. Um, so if you're involved at the beginning, you can help uh, design and make sure that, that the system is technically sound. If there's already a succession planning program in place, you can apply your I.O. expertise to make sure that everything has been developed, designed, and, and to a, a level, level of rigor that, that we know it should be as IO psychologists. Whether it's in defining the position requirements, uh, developing the, the employee development program or the leadership development program, 
uh, identifying high potential employees, uh, and then the selection of the eventual su successor. Uh, our second recommendation is to partner with your academic colleagues to study and write about succession planning programs. Uh, help to demystify succession planning for your colleagues. Uh, let them see that succession planning uh, is an area that we are experts in. Um, and so if you are conducting a study related uh, in some way to succession planning, make sure that you, you include that in your study somewhere. Uh, see if you can even include succession planning in the title of a study uh, or of, of a, a submission to SIOP. Um, help to, to demystify succession planning for IOs. Uh, and our final recommendation uh, is to embrace the learning organization approach to developing and capturing knowledge at all organizational levels. And we mentioned this earlier, but uh, it's really important that for all organizations to grow and adapt and evolve, that employees that at all levels are encouraged and really driven to continually develop into whatever their future role will be. Whether it's a future key position or not, uh, we really want to uh, emphasize that organizational learning and, and having a culture where everyone feels as though they, they should develop uh, is, is critical. Um, all right, well, that brings us through the presentation. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions about succession planning or about the SIOP Practitioner webcast series, uh, please let us know. I'm Mike Cambern, and my email address is listed there. And I'm Marnie Falcone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.